What's up, guys? It's ATL Ains United Podcast. This is Season 2, Episode 3. And uh, we just got back from the long journey return from Costa Rica. And it wasn't a pretty journey. I didn't actually make it myself. But you know what? I'm glad our team is back in Atlanta on U.S. soil. We're here to get you guys all caught up. I'm Blake, joined as always by my co-host. I'm ATL Joe. And Blake, I don't think Atlanta even left the city of Atlanta. Yeah, I, we definitely didn't didn't bring any of our skills down to Costa Rica, but we'll see if they brought it back home. We're going to be up in Kennesaw. Let's do this thing. That's right. We back. We back in Atlanta. Ken- and we ATLians United podcast. Kennesaw, technically. We're in Kennesaw. Yeah. <laughs> Either way, it's Georgia. We're, we're going to claim it as greater Atlanta area. And we're going to get some greater Atlanta goals. And if you guys could give us some greater Atlanta ratings, please give us five stars for the five stripes. Because we don't stop. Never stop. We've got a lot of news. Obviously, if you guys haven't seen the breaking headlines, which weren't that breaking, but we got smashed down in Costa Rica against Tierdiano. We lost 3-1 to one in the opener of the CONCACAF Champions League. A lot more to come on that. We are still in this tie. That's the only thing I'm going to highlight in this news section. We're still in this tie. It goes by the away goals tiebreaker. We'll break that down later as well. Only two goals down, coming back home. Going to be in Kennesaw because of Monster Jam. Don't forget about Monster Jam. I need a, I need to get an update on who won Monster Jam, by the way, Joe. And no, uh, that's that's, uh, that's coming up this weekend. That's why we're not in the bins. Oh, okay. So they haven't won yet. No, no, no. no. I think the dirt's already in there. They already piled all the dirt in Mercedes Benz. So they got to get it ready. Get all the mountains of dirt ready. Uh, we had a lot of other CONCACAF Champions League games going on. MLS season has not yet started. A couple notable highlights. Toronto also got killed 4-0. Uh, to nothing. Um, So that's another MLS team. Honestly, I'm rooting for all the MLS teams in, in this CONCACAF Champions League, Joe, because we've never won it in its current format, the MLS as a whole. Toronto got closest recently, but... Gosh, I mean, we lose 3-1. We'll tell the commissioner to get rid of the salary cap and we'll just sweep it every single year because we have so much money. Yeah, yeah, and again, salary cap does put a big hindrance on our progress as a club, but we can't use it as an excuse. We came in with a lot of talent and we just got beat, as well as Toronto on the road. Jack Black was spotted in East Atlanta Village having brunch at Argosy. Is that relevant? I don't know, but there's a pretty funny video online about it, and I'm a big Jack Black fan, so I wish I'd run into him. I was I was down in East Atlanta Village recently. I've got a, a very, very source close to to the source. A source close to the source. Is that right? That's right. And it sounds not like a very good. He's source. in Atlanta making a movie. That School of Rock returns. Oh, that would be great. That'd be great. I love School of Rock. Fantastic movie. Uh, we also had a sighting. Um, this one came out of nowhere. It, uh, the Sun. The Sun made a sighting. I oh thought, man! I think it had rained for like ten straight days on on Sunday. Were you at Bobby Dodd? And then Monday, we got sun. So I figured I would um, also. That was breaking news for me. I hadn't. I, my vitamin D levels are completely depleted. So yeah, great news. Uh, Jack Black and the Sun were spotted in Atlanta. Uh, Miggy was also spotted, not playing in an Atlanta United jersey, unfortunately. Uh, but he played his first Newcastle start, should have scored a goal, had a one-on-one with the keeper, chipped the keeper, hit it off of the post. Oh, my gosh. And the follow-up came through, and the the striker knocked it off the post again. So it was a double post shot by Miggy. And it, you saw some of his true speed that we all 
grew to love here in Atlanta with that breakaway too. Gosh, and he was so much fun to watch out on the pitch. I was up at 10 a.m. on Saturday, and I was excited. I was like, I cannot wait to watch this Newcastle game. Miggy flew all over the field. Best player on the pitch, in my opinion, and a lot of a lot of like pundits and experts out there said that Miguel Almiron, uh, you know, that have only watched the English league, they haven't even watched the MLS. They say it could be the signing of the season midway through the season because you know he was a January signing, which is midweek. I'm sorry, mid season for the Premier League. Mm-hmm. So who knows? I mean, Newcastle is fighting its relegation. They got three points on Saturday. That's a big step for them. They're in a lot more zone of safety, if you will, in that mid table. And yeah, and, and Miggy was the main reason they won he's the one that drew the foul that gave the other player a red card and they went 10 men down and it was just so great seeing him back out there but it really it got me hurting not seeing an Atlanta United jersey on Miguel on her own Blake injury report injury 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 report yeah we'll keep this short not so sweet uh Escobar he's coming back shortly I think he was missed dearly our defense looked all sorts of disorganized in Costa Rica at Herediano. But uh, he should be back in training. We haven't gotten a lot to report on in terms of injuries between these two ties. So I think that Escobar's got a chance to come back Thursday. I don't expect to see him starting. He hasn't trained yet. So keep an eye out and see if once he returns to training, and then maybe put a week out from that for to see him in game action, possibly. Also, uh, Kratz Kratz fever is still day to day. So if you guys hear Ted Nugent blasting over the loudspeakers in Kennesaw, maybe he's back. Maybe he's not. It's still day to day. Anyways, that's all we got this week for injuries. We need to, We need to jump right into it. It was the Champions League recap. That's right, the Champions League. And we got a great start to the season. These are the champions. Ba, 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 ba. It looked like a high school field, but didn't have the same like European Champions League night atmosphere there. Yeah, and let me give you a quick little update on the Champions League, the rest of the field, because Atlanta United was not the only team to disappoint. There were a couple of... of favorites going into this, and they did not have a good result as well. You had Tigres... Mexican club, very favored to make it to the final, and they had a one nothing loss to Saprissa, the other Costa Rican team in the league. So that they're going back to Tigres in the second leg to back to Mexico, and and maybe they'll pull out a good win. They're maybe in a little bit better shoes than Atlanta is at the current moment. Uh, another huge surprise was Monterey, and they are no doubt the favorites to win it all. And they were going up against one of the worst teams in the in the whole tournament. Uh, but don't tell them, the El, El Salvadorian club, Alianza, they came out with a tie, 0-0. And that's about the best Alianza can hope for. Um, and now they got to go to Monterey, which is a very, very difficult place to play. And perhaps they can pull out the crazy upset. And that's one key to watch if, if you're an Atlanta United fan because that is the bra- bottom side of the bracket where Atlanta United faces the winner should Atlanta United go on. They would face the winner of Monterey and Alianza. I think it's uh, Alianza, like uh, that Alejandro song. Alianza, Alianza. That might sound better than Ali, my, Ali, 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 my, my thick Georgia accent. That, I, I don't know <laughs> if that's true, actually. I just it was more fun to say. Well, I, I like your way better, so we'll, we'll go with uh, Alianza. Alianza. <laughs> and yeah. a, another good one to go. Good big time upset. Toronto lost four to nothing, and right there with Alianza might be the worst team in the tournament is Independiente from Panama. No, not the Independiente that Barco came from. This is the Panamanian club, one of a very small country, who they came on and had a really good World Cup year. Panama! Dun, dun. Remember that? Didn't we sing that song last year for the World Cup? During our World Cup podcast. Yeah, yeah you, you were all about that. Yeah, I really like Panama. But Toronto loses 4-0. to zero. You mentioned it just earlier. And that is incredible. Now, that's going to be... That's something that Atlanta United knows that they are not Toronto. So, at least you got... An away goal to hang your hat on. That's that's pretty much all we have to hang our hat on right now. <laughs> that's, all, that's all we got. <laughs> we got we got an away goal. <laughs> it was a good podcast episode. We'll see you guys later. <laughs> yeah, we're done. We're done. Pull us through in Kennesaw, guys. No, but uh, but back to some more pressing news. Atlanta United is now down three to one going into Kennesaw. 
So let me tell you guys what, what we need to do. We need to win 2 nothing. That is the best way here and out of of getting into the next round. 2 nothing sends us through. After that, if they score a goal three and we score three and, and just a reverse fixture, it goes straight to penalty kicks at the end of the whistle. If, if we win 4-2... We lose, right? Yeah, if we win 4-2, to two, which is a great score in normal days, we're knocked out because of their two away goals tiebreaker. So anytime they score a goal, we're going to have to score three or more than them to move on. So 2 to nothing is what we're looking for. So we're going to have to come out and play some very sound defense. Do not let them have that surprise attack, that little counterattack that they killed us on a couple times, and go out and get a couple goals. Well, let's talk about what went down, Joe. Uh, first half. First half, <clears throat> I, I felt like we came out and we matched their speed initially. We got caught ball watching a lot. We had some costly mistakes, and it was clear that they were in a little bit better fitness levels by the end of the half, in my opinion. They just seem to be burning us on some plays that I feel like if our players were at full fitness in the middle of match form, wouldn't have gotten burned on. Let's talk about Hirdiano's coach with the baseball cap and the blazer with the t-shirt underneath. I liked that guy. Did you did you catch him at all? I mean, I, I never like, like an opponent's coach, but compared to Frank Dubair, he was like sitting down the whole game. Their coach was up with his baseball cap on. And he was the most animated guy. Like I feel, I feel like he was more animated than yeah. most of the guys in the fan, like the fans. Like, he looked he like crazy. he was sponsored by So So Def Records. <laughs> <laughs> he looked like he could easily be on the cover of a rap album, and he legitimately came out there and showed how awesome he was. The 1990s rapper for sure uh, could have gone in with with Biggie and Tupac era. Yeah, and and so uh, we all know we watched the game and break down. It looked. Very much like Atlanta United was in their preseason form. A lot like we came out against Houston in the first game of last year. And were slow to start. Had had some road legs on us and, and did not go. And then playing a team in mid-season form in Iridiano. And they were out there guns blazing, running hard and fast, throwing numbers at us in attack. And it all started with that LGP boneheaded play after he got a chest pass from Bello. And he heads it back to the middle of the goal in the top of the box for an easy chip by Ortiz to start us off in really bad shape. Oh, just absolutely terrible. And LGP, who a lot of people going into the season said he's irreplaceable, he's our most solid defender, he has nowhere to go but up from here because that was a beautiful assist to the other team. Like, there are some bad back passes, there's some sketchy defensive play, but he just teed it up for this guy. I mean, it could not have been more perfectly in his run. He just had to give it a little dink, and it's done. And uh, still a nice chip. No, not trying to take anything away from the goal, but absolutely horrendous play by LGP. It, it was not. It was soccer 101 of what you don't do. When you're on defense, you do not pass it back to the middle of the field on your own defensive line. And I do think later in the game, especially the second half, LGP stepped it up and started playing much better. But that mistake was inex- inexcusable. And giving them that one goal just makes it that much harder for us to come back. Uh, and then we did not get any better with that three-man back line getting exposed on our second goal, where we had two players in Robinson and LGP step up to one player with the ball who was e- played an easy through ball to a three-on-one break where Parkhurst had to decide who he's going to cover, and he was not able to cover Azo Fifo, who was, had a one-on-one with Brad Guzan and just slotted it past him. And Brad tried his best, but that, that's a very tough position for him to be in. Yeah, and I mean, we got one back uh, before, you know, too long. Julian Gressel gets on the scoreboard. He, he's our debut goal of the season, uh, rifled it off of someone's back. It's not an own goal because there wasn't really a touch there. It was more of a deflection. Yeah, Julian, Julian gets the goal. But, I mean, we just had breakdowns in allowing their goals, and, and we can talk a little bit more about maybe what went wrong with our defense, Joe, but... Gosh, I I just was disappointed all around, to be honest with you. I was watching, actually, down in East Atlanta Village. I I missed Jack Black, unfortunately. But I was there at Midway Pub. I believe it's Footy Mob's home bar. But I was just there with some friends. And it was just deflating. Everyone came in very excited about the season starting off. Like last year when I traveled to Houston for the opening match, the deflation level reminded me a lot of that. It's like, the season's starting everyone's hype we're ready to go and it's like our our team and our club is not as fired up as the fan base 
I just felt like they came out flat. And did you see how many traveling fans and props to anyone listening to the show or anyone that you know that made it down to Costa Rica? That That's just a tremendous display of, of support. And, and to go all the way down there, I'm sure traveling was challenging at times. I've heard Uber is actually banned in Costa Rica, so I have no idea how people got around. I guess there used to be taxis back in the day. I yeah, I saw that. numbers on the report, and they said Atlanta had over 200 fans there. And by the looks of the stands, it looked like we had at least 500-plus there. It, we had traveled in herds, and that was very – props to everybody that came. Good for you. Um, unfortunately, the result didn't get going your way. But the second half, we did start looking a little bit better. And we start and started to put press a little bit more, create a little bit more opportunities. And I really think that that came with Darlington Nagby coming into the game and later Tito Vijalba adding another spark off the bench. And, and we started to form a lot more attack with Nagby creating a wonderful chance in the 80-some minute that had a, a, a hairline save by the goalie. Props to him for making a wonderful save. And then very late in the game in the 90th minute, Tito Vizjalba rockets one off the post. I thought the Lion Tamer had, had shown his true colors, but it went off the post. And it was a little bit, little bit hurting for me. And you know what? I'm thirsty. Beer of the week! I couldn't have said it better myself. You need a beer? Yeah. <laughs> Every week. Uh, guys, we're going back, and this this brewery holds a special place in my heart. I'll go ahead and, and intro it. Uh, Red Hair, they actually had us up for a live show last year. Had a fantastic time, fantastic team, fantastic brewery, and uh, definitely the closest brewery to the Atlanta United training ground. Let me and, spike uh, this one in. We got the Gangway IPA. A-T-L. Well spiked as always, Joe. But yeah, Gangway, uh, citrusy, it's piney, slightly bitter, definitely has... Some hops in there. I think it sits right at 6.2%. Very crisp. It's a very crisp, bold taste. We had it some... Uh, packs we, a punch. We had some chicken, some like really, really tasty chicken cooked off the green egg tonight. And I, I would say this pairs really well with a nice like barbecued chicken. What, like, what would you pair this with, Joe? I couldn't say that better than you just said it yourself. You couldn't say it than I just said it. Better than myself. I just had a mouthful of beer and tried to come up with something on the fly. That was pretty and good. That's what came out. It does look like they open. They're opening up either like a second distribution center or a uh, a second brewery in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I, I don't know. It, I know we got a lot of actual Atlanta United fans in North Carolina. So I just want to give a random shout out to anyone that lives in North Carolina that supports Atlanta United. Listen to this podcast. I know we don't cover out of state very much. But what I found out, just traveling around talking to people, is that Atlanta United is actually kind of becoming the South's team. Now, I know there's talks of like Charlotte and Nashville. Nashville's confirmed getting teams in the future. But I know we got a lot of fans out there. So if anyone's listening from North Carolina, a little shout out to you guys. I know there's a whole like Atlanta United, North Carolina supporters group up there. We're going to keep drinking red hair. I know they got in North Carolina now. Marietta, Georgia's its home. If you guys ever get done with training, once you're an Atlanta United player, you can stop by. And I get a beer at Red Hair. Actually, Coach probably wouldn't well let you do that. Anyways, let's get into it. It's time for Total Tactique. Total Tactique! It's Franck de Boer's Dub War. Tactics were something that was on everyone's mind coming from off season into this first leg of the CONCACAF Champions League. How are you going to line up? What's it going to look like? What is Frank Dubor's signature formation? Are we going to have the same pressing style? Is our attack going to be as fluid? And all I'm going to say is, this last game raised a lot more doubts than it did provide answers. What did you think about the formation starting off? We started out in that 3-4-3 three, three formation. Three center backs with two wing backs that played more of a midfield style, and two defensive mids, and three strikers. And I, we got exposed early, but that that could be due to a brand new formation. Everyone trying to learn how to play in dub or style. And we had a couple of young faces out there. I mean, a lot of people were giving George Bello a, a bunch of, of flack for not playing that well. Ezekiel Barco trying to really take it all upon his shoulders and dribble around the entire team to turn it over. Wait a second. Did you did you say that George Bello was on the field? Yeah, George Bello was on the field. Because I had a debate with a guy when I was watching the game that 
We didn't even know if Bella was on the field. That's how few touches he got. You know what? I don't think Ezekiel Barco knew Bella was on the field because there was a play in that first half where Barco was dribbling it right at the top of the box and he was looking to his right and Bella was making this diagonal run on his left would have been one-on-one with the goalie, but Barco decided to try to dribble around three players backwards and then he turned the ball over. Yeah, and I'm not meaning to give Bella a hard time. It just did seem like he got lost out on that left flank a lot. So let's talk about how we came out. Obviously, we came out with Parkey starting. I thought Parkey got exposed ball watching a couple times. You could just tell Parkey hasn't operated a ton in a system like DeBoer's. And I, I think it showed. I think LGP, we already talked about his boneheaded play to set up their first goal. I think he looked a little bit shook at the back. And, and honestly, I mean, what did you think about Robinson? And that was what I was going to ask you about. I, I, I don't really know enough to say he had a good game or a bad game, but I thought Miles Robinson was good to see him out there. Well, I thought he had some good one-on-one close downs and breakups and he saved a goal he had a a Parkhurst-esque clearance from the back line in that game which that could have made it four to one and then we're talking a whole different story about if we have a lifeline or not so Robinson I thought played well enough on a back line that just seemed to not really be clicking yeah I mean so you gotta ask questions though why is it not clicking and a lot of people the no tactics and we talked about it last episode We are switching from man-marking pressing, so everyone's pressing a man, when we line up to to zone pressing, and I think it led to a lot of what you would call ball watching. I I remember a couple specific episodes where the ball was going over Parkey's head, and he just stood there as a player made a run in behind him, and Parkey was the last guy back. Gressel was way up the pitch, and that was really disturbing for me to see. We seemed like we were so vulnerable to play behind. They had that one breakaway goal. I believe that was for their second goal. Mm -hmm. Their third goal came off a set piece, but they still broke behind the back line. No one was marking him at the far post. Gressel got beat at the far post. Got beat at the far post. So we're getting beat in behind. And then obviously the first goal for them, LGP, yeah, he was still in behind our whole defense. But what I'm saying is they weren't creating much when they were in front of us. But once they got behind our back line, they had such an easy time penetrating it. And I, it was just disturbing to see. I'm, I'm hoping that it's because we're still adapting to a zone press. But I, I do think it's going to be taking some time in practice to learn how the dub or really wants to implement it. But another uh, scary thing that I noticed that d- throughout the game, especially in that first half, when we got on offense, it seemed like our players got isolated out there. And you had a lot of Ezekiel Barco, Petey Martinez, and Julian Gressel. Although at times we're creating some stuff, it looked like they were on an island trying to do too much themselves and not so much playing as a team. And there was no help behind them because we had those two defensive midfielders in Lorenowitz and Remedy who may be good on their own, but I think that a tactical change that we might see in this next game could really help us link the passage from defense to offense whereas Remedy was trying to do that and he was just doing direct passes trying to cut through everybody straight to Joseph and he was passing right into the defense of they had a four-man back line that he was just passing hitting one of those four players and not Joseph yeah and I, I actually talked about this a little bit last week but one of my concerns with the idea of Nagby leaving which we now know is not a reality was the link between midfield and attack. We lacked it. We lacked it until Nagby came on, in my opinion. And Nagby did make an entrance and appearance in the second half. And I think it changed the way we played. But guess who had the fewest touches on Atlanta United for this game? I bet bet you can guess. I bet it's Joseph Martinez. It's Joseph Martinez. He had his one shot that a clear header on goal... That he made so many times last year. He probably had about 12 to 15 header goals last year. Yeah. And he missed the target. But what concerned me was the link-up play we were expecting to see between Petey, who I think had a great game, just in terms of showing his skill. But I don't think he had a great game fitting into this system. And and Barco, I, I thought with them being roommates and getting their hair done together, that they would have more synergy there. But we couldn't get the ball from midfield to Joseph. Joseph did not, he he wasn't able to play his natural game. Joseph, although he is a just like poacher, striker, there at the right time, reliant on service, like reliant on great balls in, at the same time, Joseph Martinez, Joe, he is a guy that likes to get involved with his back to goal, like come up and take a touch, 
you know, bounce it out to a winger, maybe bounce it back to a central attacking midfielder. He likes to be involved in the buildup. And he just felt isolated. And when you see isolated Joseph, Joseph gets kind of in what I would call mopey Joseph mode. He kind of puts his head down. He kind of lingers offside. He kind of walks around the pitch. And whenever you see that Joseph, you know you know he's not getting any service. He's not getting any touches. He's not involved in the buildup. So we got to find a way to get this guy more touches. Well, Blake, we've talked about the bad. The thing is, it's only the second game coming up for us. And we can make changes and we can fix this. And we still have that lifeline of a chance. The changes I want to see, and I know a lot of people want to see. You talked about Nagby coming in. He came in as a left winger for Barco. But I would like to see a tactical change. We're going to keep the same formation. It's DeBoer's style. He's, I would like to see him come in for Jeff Lorenowitz. Uh, or if you guys perhaps would prefer Remedy, but that's not my style. I want Remedy in the game. But Nagby becomes a central midfielder that can link the team and help us pushing the ball up. And if I were to make another change, this one might be debatable to some because they love Tito off the bench. But I want to see Tito, a guy who's proven goal scorer on our team, replace Barco on that left wing. And Barco could be a guy to come in late in the game if we need him to. Or to close out the game, he can dribble away from everybody. And if Tito doesn't come into the game, I, I absolutely would keep Barco on a short leash. And if he's not having a good first half, second half sub Tito in the game. Yeah, and I think something we haven't even talked on in, in that we have to. like I know DeBoer has his system. He has what he likes to do. But with the current list of players we have and, and the need to link up, both Petey Martinez and Ezekiel Barco have played a number 10. It looks like we're not going to play a 10 this year, which is the traditional link up between the midfield and the striker, right? And so that's where Miguel Almiron played. For our listeners familiar with kind of formations and our past structure, Joseph needs a guy to get him the ball, like I just said. I think Barco and definitely Petey Martinez can do it, but they're both playing out wide. I don't know why we're not looking at a two-striker system with a number 10 playing right behind. We know that Tito Vijaba can play that striker role. We know that Petey Martinez can play that second striker role. And we also know that Ezekiel Barco in the past has actually played up front. So I think we should actually look at a 1-2 triangle up front. And maybe DeBoer, just he would never consider it. But with the current players and utilization we have, I would love to see, you know, like if we want to line up with Nagby and Remedy as our central midfielders playing kind of more defensive, put Petey Martinez right in front of him and put Tito and Joseph up top and just see what we can do. Because they'll be making runs in behind all night long. I really like that strategy because the bottom line is coming into this game, we need to score more goals. So we need to line up tactically that's going to allow us to score the most goals possible. Because if we don't score that 2 nothing, 3-1 plus the penalty shootout or 3-plus goal advantage... We're out of this tournament. And we won't get to you won't get to hear me sing the Champions League song anymore. These are the champions. That's pretty good, right? I liked it. Yeah. It sounds better than the little Heineken ad on UEFA Champions League, but we'll work on it. Especially uh, if we advance. It sounds like we have a good plan in place, but now we need to preview who we're facing in the second leg. You guessed it. We're facing Erdiano. Erdiano. The same team we played in leg one. Shocker. And that's what a two-leg tournament is, ladies and gentlemen. I've done my job. Good work. We need a 2 nothing win. We've talked about it. 3-1 win. We go to a penalty shootout. Otherwise, we need to win by three or more. If you guys get online, uh, Twitter, Reddit, if anyone's still on Facebook, you might see people with those like boxes of all the different scenarios of how we win. It's really simple. We need to just win five to nothing. Then we don't worry about any scenarios. So I think we need to go out there and try to put five goals in. I want to drop something in. We're playing at Fifth Third Bank Stadium in Kennesaw. That's the name of the stadium, right? Yeah, that's right. If we win five to three, like Fifth Third, don't do that. We'll get knocked out. Yeah, that's not a good score. So I hope the stadium name is not foreshadowing. Anyways, whoever's heading up to Kennesaw, mad respect on Thursday. I'm actually heading out of the country, but I did want to update you guys on the weather if you're traveling up there. It's going to rain. Shocker. Atlanta United rain, right? Like I said, the sun made a uh, shock appearance earlier the week, but 65% chance of rain, 50 degree Fahrenheit at the time of kickoff. Don't let it stop you guys. We need Rowdy and Proud more than ever. 
We got to get behind the team from the start. We got to get goals. We got to get them fast. If it's 0 0 at halftime, there's going to be a lot of anxiety on the team. We need to get one or two first half goals. We need to put that performance behind us on that. That wasn't even turf that we played on down in Costa Rica. That was like that was like the really, really bad turf. Like I know we play on turf at Mercedes Benz, so I don't want to hate on AstroTurf. We're actually going to be playing on grass in Kennesaw. And I just feel like our players have the skill, have the talent to get out in front and win this game. So no matter the weather, you guys get up to Kennesaw and pull us through. Yeah, and so we're still facing this Ariano team. And what did they do so well that, that hurt us? It was their quick, speedy players hitting us hard on a counterattack. They sat with four men at the back. They had a strong defensive front with those four men. And they pushed everybody else up on attack and just hit us hard and fast. There were three players. So I, I did every week. I always do at least three players of players to watch. I, I, I saw three players during this past game I want to highlight. And one of them was in my preview last week. And that is as a FIFA. That was the guy who hit hit the cor- um the cross in on the third goal with a beautiful free kick, and he was the one that scored a one on one goal against Brad Guzan, and he was all over the field with great play with the ball at his feet. And then there was another player in Jimmy Marine. He torched us in the first half. He ended up getting being a late game sub, but he was running circles around our defense. And finally, watch out for Jose Guillermo Ortiz. A former MLS player for DC United, yeah. now playing on Erdiano, he scored that chip goal, and he was constantly making runs, putting our players in the danger zone, and making runs right at the goal and cutting it back to try to find some other players. We need to lock down those three players, and I think we have a good chance at turning the table and trying to win this game. Yeah, so obviously, guys, bummer this one is not in Mercedes-Benz. If you guys didn't listen to our last episode, Monster Jam is in town, and Mercedes-Benz is going to be filled with dirt. Uh, we're going to be back in the bins for our season opener in FC Cincinnati. While we got you guys, get out there on Thursday, pull us through this tie. Let's make sure this is a competition we stay in. We got another game coming up at the weekend, and I know it sounds crazy. We're actually not going to release another episode until after it's occurred, so we got to go ahead and get you guys ready for the MLS. So if you're tuning in today and all you cared about was listening to uh, our preview of what went wrong in Costa Rica and what hopefully is going to go right in Kennesaw Thursday, um, feel free to pause this. But we're going to go ahead and jump in, preview the MLS season ahead, preview our title defense, and preview our first matchup, which is on the road in that beautiful new stadium in the District of Columbia. So, uh, yeah, Joe, let's talk about the MLS just to start and talk about winners and losers from the off season. We got a lot to catch up on. Yeah, I mean, kind of take this away. What, what do you think about this season ahead, specifically related to the MLS? Yeah, MLS had a crazy offseason, and welcome back to the league, guys. We're going to come back and try to win the Supporters' Shield and defend our MLS title. Uh, but there was a lot of moves. MLS became a big-time selling club. There was a lot of people going overseas, and some teams decided to sell their players and not bring people in. Some teams decided... To bring some stars in, I want to hit Toronto up. Toronto may be the biggest losers of this (laughs) offseason. They lost Giovinco and Victor Vasquez, two of their top players. I'd argue that Victor Vasquez may have been their best player, him and Giovinco, and they did not replace them with any viable option. Do you remember when Toronto came the very first season of our existence? Uh, I was getting near playoff time. It was a big match for them. Giovinco hit a a nasty free kick to get the draw in the bins. Right at the final minute. There was a banner, and if they're listening to this podcast, please shoot us an email to let us know because it was one of the most like wrong but fantastic banners I've ever seen. It had pictures of all the U.S. men's national team players that didn't qualify for the World Cup that played for Toronto. Josie like, and Michael like Bradley. Josie and Michael Bradley, and the, the banner said, Biggest the- Losers. So when you said they were the biggest losers in the offseason, I had this flashback moment of, Toronto's always been the biggest losers. Josie, Michael Bradley, didn't get us to the World Cup. Now they lost Giovinco, who was really the only player I enjoyed watching on Toronto. Yeah, well then you got other teams like LA Galaxy, and we talked earlier in the show about no salary cap, or with the salary cap in MLS. Well, LA Galaxy is just going to completely ignore that all the way, and they still have four designated players on their team, and we're just days away from the start of the season. So as of this podcast, I have not seen them make any adjustments. They still have Zlatan, who may be four designated players all in his own right. 
and they still and they have both the Dos Santos brothers and they got Alessandrini. All so, under their designated player contracts. So has anyone ever actually just tried the MLS on this and called their bluff? Because I thought that's what we might try before we sold Miguel Almiron, before we sold Miggy. I thought maybe we might just be like, so what are you going to do? Like, we're going to pay them all because it's our money. And they're going to bring the league more revenue because they're great players. Yeah, are they good? if they start the season like that, what are they going to do? Are they going to find them? Are playing. they going to ban them from playing? And or? then does the MLS like force them to cut one? And then if I was the Galaxy, I'd be like, all right, so who are you going to cut? Oh, be- definitely one of the Dos Santos brothers. Because I mean, whose who's hands is it in at that point? They're on the payroll of the LA Galaxy. This whole DP thing is what I'm getting at, and we can talk about this as the season goes on. It needs to be done away with. If you want to cap the salaries, maybe that makes sense. But I think the DP situation is just such a disgrace to the league because we have clubs with the funds to buy the top players in the world but the mls just doesn't want them to have more than three well la i would put if they can pull this off they're in the winner category especially they made one more move i want to hit real quick guillermo barros shalato is their new head coach and we all thought he may be coming to atlanta but la is the one that snagged him yeah Great coach, and that's going to be a dangerous team. Zlatan has said he's going to break every single MLS record this year. So I don't know how he's planning on doing that, but it should be fun to watch. Yeah, so uh, moving on, FC Cincinnati is the new team in, in the town. They're the reason that we're not going to play D.C. or Orlando City twice or three times this year. We're only going to play every team twice. And they've really started off great by putting their roster together with some big names, especially defensively, with players like Alvis Powell, Greg Garza, and Kendall Waston. And they brought a good player up front with Fernando Addy. And then they surrounded them with a bunch of just kind of holdovers from their USAL team and other players I don't really know about. This is going to be fun. FC Cincinnati is our home opener in the bins. It's going to be bittersweet to see Garza out there if he's not hurt, which he probably will be because it's Greg Garza. Love you, Greg, but you're always hurt. But at the same time, I think that like what we're seeing from this team is they're focusing on strengthening their back line. So they're trying to not be Minnesota United of three years ago, in my opinion. Remember, Minnesota just let in like five to six goals a game. I think the first time we played Minnesota United, because in our inaugural season was their inaugural season, we went up there in the snow, and I think we put six past them. Yeah, that was the first Joseph mm-hmm. Hattrick. First hey. ever, yeah. So I think they're trying to keep some goals out, and and I think, I, I, I wouldn't say they have as much momentum as we did our first year. I don't think they have the fan base quite yet, but they did have a strong team in lower in lower divisions and i don't think anyone should sleep on fc cincinnati as this lineup and this team gets built together they got a pretty great front office i think they're gonna have packed out stadiums i'm excited about their addition to the league and i can't wait yeah to go up there to cincinnati and, and you're speaking and of are they gonna be atlanta or minnesota well speaking of minnesota they've revamped their roster they by adding a couple center backs and two defensive midfielders and a brand new goalie so they're really going to try not to concede 70 goals for a third straight season you know what columbus crew is staying in columbus i think that whole rumor is gone and out the window they're not going to austin they're staying home but they forgot to bring back all their other good players and yeah they lost stefan to man city their goalkeeper best player in my opinion with an asterisk there he's supposed to leave in july in the summer transfer window so he'll start the season with them but then he's on his way out uh and they, they didn't do anything to really bolster their roster they lost their manager greg burhalter to team usa but then they're bringing in caleb porter a uh, former it uh, took a year off after he was coaching portland and that's why nagby was rumored to them but they never got that deal done so they're just gonna keep their same roster and try to hope that they're gonna do better yeah but i mean they got new ownership group Same ownership group from the Cleveland Browns. And I saw a really cool article the other day. They're actually going to bus for free any Ohio State student that wants to go to Columbus Crew game. So I think it's going to be a lot rowdier atmospheres. So they're like busing in students. You know you got Ohio State University right there. They're really trying to get some hype, this new ownership group, around this team. There's talks of building a new stadium. I think good things are on the way for the crew. And props to all who helped with the Save the Crew movement. Because I think that... Save the crew. That movement was crucial to the MLS putting its foot down and not being like every other league out there that would just, hey, you can just buy this team and move it wherever you want. Because that's what we've seen with the NFL. That's what we've seen in the past with the MLS. I would really like for 
these original teams and these cities that have had these clubs for a long time to dig their roots way down deep and hold on to these teams. And it was cool to see in Columbus the support that this team got. Well, Portland's going to try to dig their roots down. They are going to revamp their stadium. But that's going to come with 11 straight games on the road to start the season (laughs) and then be kind of like D.C. of last year, Atlanta of two years ago, and have a backloaded home schedule at the end of the season, which a lot of time turns out to help them out. And they're bringing back basically the same roster that took them to the MLS Cup final. So if they can weather the storm at the beginning of the season, they may be a team to watch out for in the West. And uh, let's get through these so we can get to the D.C. United uh, preview. But Seattle is a team that might attack Portland as the best team in the West. They're getting Jordan Morris back along with a full season of Rio Diaz who lit it up at the end of the season uh, as long as Nick Ladero is going to be with him too. Yeah, Orlando signed Nani, the Portuguese winger, played for Manchester United for a long time. He's just going to fail probably because he went to Orlando. Terrible is, decision is from Nani. Added to the long list of big signings by Orlando that just did not make them better. Yeah, and at the same time, I, I, I do feel bad for Nani. One of his former teammates is actually Wayne Rooney. And who does Wayne Rooney play for? Well, that's that's our first opponent, D.C. United. So. And then there was D.C. United. Yeah, and, and uh, Wayne Rooney is their, he's their superstar. But this is a really solid team. I think a lot of these people expected them to lose their other key star, in my opinion, Luciano Acosta this year. There were some PSG rumors, the top club in France. He ended up sticking with the team. So we go into this game. They still got Rooney. They got Acosta back. That was their dynamic duo. And here is your DC United preview for all you guys that weathered the storm of what happened in the offseason of MLS. We are playing DC United to open the season. And they are perhaps, in my opinion the top team coming in to challenge Atlanta United in the MLS. This is going to be a very, very difficult game, and we got to go on the road after short rest of having our leg two. Hopefully it's a successful leg two, we'll see, of the CONCACAF Champions League. And we're facing D.C. United, a team that caught thunder at the end of last year when they brought Wayne Rooney in, at their, and they also debuted their brand new stadium. Is it called Audi Field? I believe that's what it's called. Yep. Yeah. And they came on and, like Thunder, made it from the bottom of the table up all the way to fourth or fifth place to go into the playoffs. And then they lost the the one-game play-in to Columbus Crew. But they were hot coming in. And they only got better. Yeah, and I think they'll fight for the Supporter Shield this year. I know you talked about that with me, Joe, earlier. This is one of our main threats this season. Um, you know, they got a talented core of U.S. players. We already talked about Wayne Rooney, Luciano Acosta, I just feel like this is a dangerous game. I think how we play on Thursday will really set us up for this road trip to D.C. I know we're going to have a lot of fans traveling up to D.C. And uh, I'm excited to get the MLS season started. I think what's on everyone's mind right now is still that CONCACAF Champions League game on Thursday. Like, are we going to advance in that competition? Either way, whatever happens in that game, we got to flip a new script and flip it to D.C. and get ready for this MLS season. Yeah, and D.C. made some big moves in the offseason. So they did lose Darren Maddox, who was playing back up to Rooney and really had no place there. And Yamil Assad had a little debacle, and he's back with his team in, uh, in South America. And they can't get a deal to work out to get him here. But they added a couple of really key players one that you guys might know in Luke Rod, Lucas Rodriguez, coming over from Estudiantes. He was very well linked to Atlanta United and uh, ended up, we had the rights to him, but now he's on a full season loan. And he is one of the young South American players that has just full of potential. And it's going to be very exciting to see him play on their left wing as long as they're not playing Atlanta United. And then they added a a guy from Boca Juniors. Yeah, Leonardo Jara. Yeah. And he's going to be great. He's going to come back as their right back. So they've really bolstered that lineup. That's also surrounded with Bill Hamid in goal, who's great, and Paul Areola and a couple of young U.S. international studs. So this is going to be a very difficult, difficult game coming off short rest. Yeah, and we got stomped up in D.C. last time we played there. So anyone going up there, let's get it back. Let's take D.C. back. Let's win this game. Let's win the one on Thursday win against dc we got one more section for you guys thanks for your patience we're going to do a little listener mail thanks for writing us all right all right all right 
Keep it short and sweet. We got one email coming in. Thought we'd uh, hit this really quick. Did Barco live up to his preseason play in the first match? That's from Tom27 at Gmail. I don't I don't even know who that is. Okay, anyways, did Barco live up to his preseason play in the first match? My answer is clear. It is no. What about you, Joe? Yeah, I, I don't think he did at all. He came in. Everyone loved how he was playing. And to me, it looked like he would dribble out of some trouble and then dribble back into some trouble and then maybe pass the ball off and turn the ball over. I said it earlier in the show. I want Tito Vajalba to start in Barco's place. Uh, I think that it's not going to happen. I think DeBoer is going to start Barco, and hopefully he makes up for it. One thing that Barco needs to do to improve is to either look for the better pass or shoot more. He had a couple of opportunities to take shots from outside the box, just inside the box, and he looked like he was afraid to pull the trigger. And you saw what happened when Gressel shot from deep. It deflected and we got a goal. Tito shot from deep. It hit the post, almost scored. Nagby almost scored from outside the box. If Barco can get some confidence and shoot from outside the box, I think he is going to elevate his game to the next level. Step it up, Barco. See you guys Thursday in Kennesaw. Thanks as always. Blake, joined by ATL Joe. We so appreciate you guys listening to us. I know it's a busy week ahead of Atlanta United. We'll let you get to it. Thanks for tuning in. Let's go win that Champions League game. We'll see you next week.